Uh, well, welcome everyone to the Construction Student Forum. Um, the purpose of this forum is to give our students an opportunity to engage with one of our field experts. Uh, the forum is for anyone who is enrolled in or has completed one of our online programs. So for today's presentation and forum, we have uh, Tom Gore, who's with Altitude Training Associates, and he's going to be our session facilitator. Myself, Andrew Demers of Stormwater One, will be the session moderator. And uh, Tom and Altitude Training Associates has been working with us for quite some time, boy, in about five years uh, now. So Tom and Scott of Altitude Training Associates, they authored our CS2OG, or Stormwater Management for Oil and Gas Construction Activities online uh, training program, uh, which is really great. And it's been, uh, it's on its about fourth edition now. So today we are lucky enough to have a sponsor um, and I would like to thank Haynes Geo. Uh, based in North Carolina, Haynes Geo Components manufactures and distributes construction BMPs throughout uh, the United States. It's through their commitment to education that um, has made today's student forum possible at no charge to you. So I wanna thank Haynes Geo for their generosity. It certainly is appreciated. Uh, so as we begin, there's going to be four parts to the forum. Um, the first thing I want to do is kind of give you the, the tips and tricks to surviving the next hour with Tom and I. And then we'll have Tom present a 15-minute presentation on preparing your construction site for winter season ahead. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and contributions. Uh, the presentation is designed as a catalyst for dialogue. So we hope that it'll um, help introduce some thoughts that you may want to cover with Tom. If you have any questions, he is an expert, and uh, it's just a great way to get some uh, free consultation. And then we'll wrap it up around quarter past the hour, and we'll send you back on to your busy day. So the ground rules, uh, the first thing we're going to ask everyone to do during the presentation is just to mute your phone. Uh, this is just to, obviously to keep some of those background noises out. If you're listening on the computer, you're welcome to just mute your microphone. I see that most everyone is muted except for Tom and I. Uh, everyone's figured it out, but if you just click on that green button, then you click mute me. If you wanna unmute yourself, you just click on the microphone one more time and then scroll over to the unmute me tab, and then uh, you'll be fine to speak. Uh, it is an open forum, so people are welcome to uh, chime in. Um, and we're gonna try and keep that to a minimum during the presentation, but if there's something you absolutely need to blurt out, feel free to do so. In the meantime, you can also use the chat feature. Uh, at the bottom of the uh, control panel, you'll see that there's a chat, and you can select uh, entire audience or just Andrew or Tom, uh, but I would just go to the entire audience is typically what people do, um, just so people can see what the questions are coming up. At the end of this, we'd love your feedback. We're always trying to improve our programs, and you know, as committed, students of ours, we want to know if this is something that you found valuable and productive, and if there's anything that we can do to change it up to make it a little more engaging or a, a better value for you, just please let us know. We're, we're amenable to change. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Tom. Again, Tom Gore is with Altitude Training Associates in Denver, Colorado. He's actually residing in Golden at the moment. And I'll hand it over to you, Tom. You've got the floor. Um, and in order to do so, let me give you the keyboard and the um, keyboard and mouse there. There you go. You have control. Okay. Do you have the screen? Uh, let me move my PowerPoint out. I pulled up uh, one of the intro slides. Um, I think, all right, go ahead and share your screen. Oh, I see why. There we go. Okay, we're on. We see Pretty you. Good. Well, thanks, Andrew, and welcome everyone to the to the discussion. Uh, what I what I don't see in any of the intro slides, or one of the things that uh, Andrew 
did not talk about was the uh, S word, and that is snow. <laughs> so actually, what we're going to be reviewing and, and and talking about are you know one of the aspects of the potential impacts from snow. So we're assuming that uh, you are here because you're interested in some tips or some discussion about how to prepare for the winter, which is snow. Now there could be another aspect of that, and this can vary greatly depending on where you uh, individually, where you professionally are located. As Andrew was pointing out, I'm in Colorado, and so we do see a fair amount of snow, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't always last very long. So we may get uh, a quite a bit of snow, and then it sort of goes away. Let's, uh, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So the topics that I want to hit on, and just as, uh, well, you know, take, take a look at some train wrecks here. And what is the potential that we face stormwater management-wise in the event that we have some snow and then the subsequent melt? So let's take a look at that and talk about that aspect of stormwater management for this season. We'll touch base a little bit on the legal requirements, and this is going to depend uh, largely for where you professionally are located, but you know we can base ourselves into what permits say and what the requirements actually are. What we try to do as a consulting team is work with people to be successful out there in the field without necessarily just focusing on what the legal requirements may be. Then let's get into some recommendations. So let's talk about some strategies. Let's review some things that I've seen that I've had some experience with out there in the field that may be beneficial to you. And we always temper this with the recognition that not all of these are going to work. Hopefully some of them can, and it's going to be based on your unique site conditions. What is the nature of your construction activity? What phase of construction you're in? And of course, potentially what, uh, what sort of impacts are you facing with uh, weather? And if you're the permittee, arguably, hopefully you're in control and some of these recommendations will work for you. Then we'll wrap it up with some Q&A. So let's, let's talk about it. Let's, let's discuss this. And if there's some aspect that I did not hit on, or if you have some questions about some specific photos or some specific field scenarios, let's see if we can uh, take care of that for you. So that's how we'll wrap it up. I'll turn it back on over to Andrew when I'm done. So the big deal, it's going to rain or it's going to snow. And that, that's what the big deal is with stormwater. It's like if it never snows or if it never rains, I, I guess we're all set. But of course, still we have the potential for having pollutants around and we still need to manage those. The precipitation has got to go somewhere. And this photo example I like to use here demonstrates and shows, well, we have a decent sized area of disturbance and we don't really have a lot of control features out there that are visible from this photo angle and it really did not snow all that much but it can melt fairly rapidly and that may be a, a difference with snow versus rain unless we have a horrific amount of rain that comes down in a short period of time some sort of microburst so it snows it's gonna melt and then where is it going to go? So if the ground is hard packed, if it's frozen, if it's already saturated from other storm events, then that precipitation from the snow melt is not going to go into the ground. Or if it's melting so fast, it may not be able to infiltrate. And then you have runoff. So this is the big deal always with stormwater management and precipitation. If I have areas of disturbance and I have runoff moving over areas of disturbance and I can have some sort of scour, especially if it's a concentrated flow. Here's another photo example. I'm out there in the field. It's raining, it's snowing. I'm out there taking photos because I do a lot of stormwater training classes all over the Rockies. So here's a development in progress, 
And let's zoom in. Let's take a, a closer look here. And you can see the retaining wall, and you see some cascading, turbid stormwater runoff coming down into a creek. So you see down there in the bottom of the photo, we actually have a creek. So we have an off-site release. This is going off the project boundary. As we zoom in a little tighter, you may be able to make out at the top of the photo, you see that riprap, and that is a lining, if you will, for a ditch. So they did put in a conveyance. They did put in a ditch to capture the snow melt and armor it with rock. But however it transpired, too much too fast or not cut in correctly, not sized correctly, the stormwater is not staying in the ditch. Now we're getting into property damage. So I could be losing sections of that retaining wall there just because the ditch failed itself. Here's another classic example. And you may be experienced with different types of snowfall. And as I indicated previously, here in Colorado, it snows and it may melt relatively quickly. The ski resorts would like you to believe that Colorado is continuously covered with snow all year round. Well, it is at the higher elevations at the ski resorts, but not down here at, you know, so I'm at the mile high level in Golden, Colorado. You see coming onto this roadway from the top right, we have some run on. You see it coming down the roadway and it's co-mingling with other run on from the project itself. So now you see this cutting, you see this scouring coming across the roadway and it's it's concentrating and we're getting into some pretty heavy gully erosion on the other side of the road down there in the bottom right of the photo. So some of the damage that we can have from to stormwater runoff and in these examples from snow melt itself. We will take a look at another photo, which is down gradient of where this is discharging. So momentarily, we'll take a look at that photo. It's like, where's all that chocolate milk going as it's running across the road? Again, this is property damage. Are we really going to be able to navigate that road very well? And this is what the problem is. And we preach this for all levels, all phases of construction. Again, if it doesn't rain, I guess we're all set. But recognizing it will rain, where is the water going to go? And that's one of those recurrent themes with stormwater management. Where is the water coming from and where is it going to go? And if we are not taking advantage of tools to manage site drainage, then we're just, it's, the stormwater is just going to have its way with our construction site. And here we go. So we have some property damage there. So those are our impacts of snow melt, not necessarily all that different from what may be happening periodically through the, the season, microbursts and et cetera, days and days of rain out there. But we want to think about the snow perhaps a little bit differently. Legal requirements. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because this can vary greatly depending on where you are. You have your state permit potentially, you have a municipal permit, and you have you know, erosion or erosion and grading control permit from the city, from the county. But let's just back up for a moment and take a look at just some of the fundamentals from the federal NPDES permit, NPDES permit. So here's a quotation from the current permit, and I recognize they do have a draft out, but this is this is fairly classic. This is you see this incorporated in virtually all state permits. That the expectation is that our control features, our BMPs, whatever our measures are that we're installing and implementing, are reflective of sound engineering, good pollution prevention, and hydrologic practices. Now what that means is the expectation is that we're selecting features that can work. They're required to work. So we're selecting them based on good design. And you see that applicable design specifications. So we're not making stuff up. We're using sound strategies that other people potentially have put together. So we're using technical drawings that other people have used to design specific control features. Here's another one right here, and this is, this is pretty solid that the expectation 
is that our control features, erosion and sediment control, and other pollution prevention practices, that they remain in continuously effective, good operating condition. And let me just follow this up with a few other bullets. This is what that means. So we talk a lot of uh, people out in the field and try to help them to understand. And they may be trying to come up with some sort of explanation, some sort of justification like, I'm working here, I can't have controls. How well is that gonna work for me to tell a regulator, hey, it snowed, I can't do stormwater now. That's not going to be very practical. That's not going to work for me. So I need to recognize that these seasonal considerations come into play. And maybe I have to amp up my plan, my strategies for how I'm going to approach these seasonal considerations. Some of you may be in shutdown mode. And that's fine. Uh, I lived in Minnesota. I was in the Minneapolis area for a couple of years. And it started snowing in the fall, early winter. And we didn't see the ground until March. So that can wreak havoc with a lot of schedules based on the nature of your construction activity. And what you're looking at is, well, the stormwater's frozen. So I don't have any runoff. Winter is now my BMP. And that's fine this moment in time. But at some point, it's going to melt. That, that snow is going to go away. And so we need to be prepared for that moment in time when the snow starts melting and the water's got to go someplace. And if the, if the ground, is, ground is frozen, then I think <laughs> you're going to have a lot of stormwater runoff. So just some discussion there on just a, some discussion on the stormwater's got to go somewhere. It's going to melt. And if the ground's frozen, now I'm dealing with some sort of runoff out there. Now let's get into what I would like to propose as some recommendations. But no, actually, before we get into the recommendations, let's talk about the not recommendations first. And I have this great quote from an inspector with Montana DEQ, and he always tells people, doing nothing is not an option. So we recognize we're going to have to have some control measures. We're going to have to have something in place. And if we just go along with business as usual and don't really change anything and approach stormwater the same way all the way around the calendar, we may not be very successful. So we do want to think about some different controls because getting snow is going to be different out there. How about this? You want to put this in your SWIP? Is that going to be one of your strategies for stormwater management? Let's just hope for the best. Maybe it won't snow this year. Well, these are all very poor and not really well thought out or organized strategies out there. So we still see a heavy reliance on sill fence out there. Take a look in the background and snow, no BMPs except for that sill fence. And of course it's laying on the ground. You see how it got blown out. And so the contractor comes back in, props it back up, puts a few more stakes in and cleans up the road and calls it good. Now for some recommendations. How about this? So think it on through, have some strategies. You cannot underestimate the power of having some written strategies and direction and following them. You will drive yourself crazy if all you do is run around and try to fix and address train wrecks out there. So think about some, some approaches here, and I want to throw out some ideas for you. Maybe this doesn't work for everybody. But based on my schedule, based on the seasonal considerations, there may be areas, there may be sections of my project I can work to completion. Or maybe I'm going to end up and shut down that area and it's just going to sit there dormant. So as I recognize and work my schedule, there can be great benefit to trying to get areas to completion, get them buttoned up. Part of that button up thing can be vegetation. So the whole problem is I have exposed soils, I get vegetation established, and now I have erosion control. Manage site drainage. We can't control Mother Nature, but we can control site drainage. Think about how and where you want water to move around the site. Identify controls that you can armor up 
and make them a little more robust and stay on top of your game. So let's go ahead and break this down a little bit. Let's take a look at these categories. We already talked about working into completion. Vegetation is my friend. Any areas I can get established vegetation in is going to help me. So planning, recognizing that I'm going to have some snowstorms, I want to go ahead and get ready. The vegetation will promote infiltration. It provides cover for the ground. And if I have runoff, it promotes sheet flows. So any areas that, as part of my working to completion or getting them off the radar, if I'm done, I'm done. What am I waiting for? Let's go ahead and think about areas that we can get covered up. If I can't plant, then maybe we can just go ahead and cover up. Any means of cover we can use will help provide us with erosion control. Okay, here's that photo after the roadway photo. So here's my train wreck coming down to that sill fence. I'm not sure how long that sill fence is actually going to work. So we want to be thinking about how we're managing stormwater runoff. One of the things that we recommend is that people promote infiltration. So here I have a slope coming down into a little ponded area. And by me breaking up the ground, making the ground more porous, it promotes infiltration. The more infiltration, the less runoff I have. Here I'm managing site drainage. It's going to snow. It did snow. It's melting. I'm capturing the runoff in that ditch. So that is a temporary conveyance. It's going to go away. And it's conveying right on over to my sediment trap. So I've put in this drainage feature over there to capture my stormwater runoff. I cut in a ditch and I do need a terminal point. The water's got to have some place to go. And so here we go. We see these in all kinds of sites. Here's a small trap. This is on a multi-family house. So tight corridor, really small projects. We can think about this as water quantity management. I do get some treatment in there. I, it doesn't have to be pretty. Here we go. I'm just managing site drainage. I'm putting in this control feature. I've got drainage features getting the water to it. So I have a little rundown coming over here to this nice little square pit. Doesn't have to be pretty, does need to be sized correctly though, and it does need to have a means of discharge. So you see the little riprap right there in the corner. So in the event that this does fill up, the water has to have some place to go. Unlike this example, I've got a ditch coming into this trap and there was no designated means of discharge. The snow melted, it filled up, it overtopped the berm in the low point, and blew it right on out. So I do want to make sure that they're installed correctly. So I do have an installation detail that's going to size this and demonstrate my low point, my weir, where it's going to discharge so I don't end up with pond failure, which is what happened here. And then it leads to some other activities. So do you like cell fence? You put a lot of investment into cell fence. I still see a lot out there, and that's fine. But you have to make it work. And if you're prone to drifting snow, so you get some high winds and you get some drifting snow, I know I wouldn't be, want to be the guy that goes out there and repairs that. Think about bomb-proofing your cell fence. If you insist you have to use cell fence, change how it gets installed. Here's an example of a contractor putting in wire mesh back cell fence with T-posts because he wants it to work and he doesn't want to be out there in the snow trying to affect repairs. This may also control traffic, access up there to areas of disturbance where we don't want people driving around to areas of disturbance. Tracking can be a real huge issue during winter months. So I get two, three feet of snow. I have ongoing melting conditions. I'm digging holes. I'm building stockpiles. I got equipment transitioning around, and I end up with this. And this can be an absolute nightmare. I don't have all the answers for tracking issues out there. A lot of the answers are largely managerial. And if I think I'm going to be able to clean up the roadway with my street sweepers out there, that can be very difficult, and it can be very expensive as well. So I may have to change my site access. If I'm not doing this year round, I can put in some rumble strips. I've got some cattle guards out there. It's snowing right now. So that can help my sediment removal capabilities of this feature right here. 
again, part of it's just managerial, how I manage my site, my subcontractors, if I need to close off areas, amp up my controls, I have my expectations, I hold people accountable for their activities on my site. After all, they are working for me, right? So I think about controlling access, manipulating, manipulating my schedules, my deliveries as necessary to fit into what it is I'm trying to accomplish. There's going to be some train wrecks. Of course, there's going to be some surprises. There's going to be the potential for strategies not working, and you just got to stay on top of your game. So you're doing inspections, you're monitoring your site, you're evaluating all of your controls that can actually work, and you get to decide here. You come across something like this, and the water's going to come down here, or it isn't, and you get to decide. Do you want the water to come down here or not? And if you want it to come down here, then you have to decide how it's going to come down here. We talked about ditches. You may be familiar with slope drains, so I can put in a couple of sections of pipe out there and then determine how I want that water to go down that hill. Or I do something to keep it put. I keep it topside up there, send it someplace else. I'm going to have other distinct pollutants and... My strategies need to be strong with those. I get those high winds. I want to make sure that my portable toilet can, can work. I've got inlet protection out there. It snows. The city comes through and plows. I can't see my inlet protection. And now I have this train wreck. Talk about a public safety hazard out there. The problem is the snow is getting ready to melt, and I got nothing. So what you may want to think about is delineators. I can't speak for all municipalities, but some municipalities train their snowplow drivers to avoid delineated inlet protection. This is just a series of curb socks coming on down the curb flow line. You see the plows are way off away around the road there. So my recommendations, if possible, work it to completion, get vegetation in, manage site drainage, armor up your controls and stay on top of your game. It's going to snow. Get ready. I can't take care of these guys for you. And depending on where you are, you got the stormwater police out there. And they can be pretty painful. And you need to work out some sort of relationship with these guys. But you pay attention to the regulations and then you select functional controls that can actually work for your applications. It's going to be a mess to try to go out there and fix things during the winter or install new stuff during the winter. So you start thinking ahead, thinking about how you want to manage site drainage, get those controls in there, and stay focused on what it is that you want to accomplish. Well, that wraps up my presentation. That's all I have for you guys. I'm going to turn it on over to Andrew here, give him control. Andrew, I'm not getting any audio. Thank you, bud. <laughs> That's I it. am, okay. All I had to do was unmute it. Uh, thanks for the heads up. Uh, that concludes our presentation, but now we're going to open it up to the student forum. So this is where we have uh, contributions or questions uh, from the audience. Uh, this is supposed to be an interactive um, uh, presentation. So. If anyone would like to pose a question to Tom, you're more than welcome to either blurt it out or type it in. I was chatting with uh, the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority, TRCA, up in Toronto, Canada. They're on the line. I know uh, Lisa is talking about uh, the fact that she's starting to uh, look at implementing her MS4, the ESC standards for MS4. And uh, perhaps she wants to chime in with something that this may, may or may not have, uh, she may or may not have thought of prior to this presentation. But anyways, it's open if anyone would like to jump in. All right. Tom, do you see um, municipalities 
uh, starting to alert their contractors. I know Denver, city and county of Denver, are very proactive about their stormwater management program. I know they're out there enforcing it. I speak with uh, them routinely. Uh, do you see municipalities going out there and just proactively engaging the community around this time of year to make sure that their controls are in um, are up to snuff and they're going to be able to withhold the pressures of the winter season? I know there are municipalities that uh, are, are proactive and are engaged in nudging contractors to take a look at their schedule and take a look at the, the calendar and recognize that the, the snow is going to be flying soon. I used to work for the city of Aurora for many years here in Colorado and I know we did the same sort of thing and maybe not too surprisingly as I'm showing you some of these photos of these train wrecks, some of them came from my time. At, at the city where contractors were not focusing on the snow and the snow melt, hoping for the best or just doing the same old thing. And there'd be a big snow and then they're out there clean, cleaning up the roadway. So I know that there are municipalities, especially the larger ones, as you're pointing out, with City County of Denver, working with the contractors and pointing out during their inspections, this looks good now, this is fine, but this, this may not cut it as soon as we start getting the six inches, two feet of snow later on. Mm. I hear you. Um, there is, there's a question from Nebraska um, and like Wyoming and those parts, they have very high wind. Uh, when you look at construction sites and so on, what would your recommendations be for those places such as Nebraska with very high winds coming in? Yeah, that can be particularly tough, and Scott Olson talks about the, the same thing. Scott Olson, the founder of Altitude Training in Cheyenne, saying, for example, we don't have cell phones, we have posts. You know, there's, there's <laughs> stakes out there. So uh, it, it, it may call for, for something dramatic. Uh, you, you, you can't stop the wind, but I do see a lot of snow fences out there just trying to keep the snow off of the roadways. And there may be some smaller versions of that, some construction fence that may work a little better to tone down some of the wind and stop the snow completely from, from blowing. But interestingly enough, as much as we get high winds around here, it, it's not consistent. It's not that bad as other parts of the country. So I do not have a lot of personal experience here in Colorado with how to deal with some of those high winds, but I'm assuming one of the things is trying to keep your uh, keep your snow in place. Now, some of the if we want to go with cell fence, you know, if that if that's the route you want to take, if you feel like you have to have that for the event when the snow is going to melt, we see people double staking the cell fence, so they'll stake it on both sides, and we also see contractors twisting each individual stake. So I may not get that trench in uh, get my uh, you know my four by or my six by six trench with my flap uh, going across the bottom of my trench if that's how I'm installing my cell phone. So it may be like sliced and may go straight into the ground. But I do see contractors thinking about those high winds that are installing that cell phone. They twist each and every stick. Otherwise, I guess I'd have to know particularly uh, specifically what the concern or the issue is. Is it just blowing snow? Is it losing losing my BMPs, or what are the what are some of the issues with the high wind? Mm. Um, that's great. Uh, one of the things I want to comment <clears throat> is that uh, the last forum we had was low cost BMPs, and you had a lot of low cost BMPs that were associated with with the silt, you know, small silt ponds. Um, sedimentation ponds and so on. I thought there was uh, a lot to be said about, uh, while you even mentioned it, about uh, when when there was the slide where you had the water coming down the rip rap. It obviously didn't have enough volume. It was cascading over that wall. Um, but just looking at the volume, you know, you're going to have a higher volume because you could have two feet of snow that is going to rapidly melt. So you have just a lot more volume that you're dealing with. Uh, but I, I thought there was uh, a, a great, I thought those were great slides just showing how you can use um, what's on your site in order to manage your stormwater by putting in small 
detention ponds or uh, just making your conveyance channel channels just a little bit larger, uh, use of berms, things of that nature. Um, and I think it's great, but I, I think it's very important that people look at their site as, hey, you're going to get a lot more volume than you're probably expecting it. And with that ground being frozen, you're not going to have a lot of solutions at your fingertips. Uh, you can't just go out and replace silt fence or um, you know, reinforce them at that time. You've got to be really proactive about this. But I liked seeing all the low-cost BMPs. Um, with that, do you have any low-cost BMPs? Like, what is your strategy? I know you guys like to use what's available to you on the site. Um, anything you want to comment on that, how you, how you like to steer people toward that? We, as I was noting, really try to talk people into increase their awareness of how beneficial the drainage controls can actually be. So when we talk about BMPs in general or various control features, so we you know see the, the trend now to talk about control features or control measures as opposed to best management practices or BMPs, we break them down into they're either erosion control, sediment control, or a drainage control. And of course there is some overlap between the drainage controls and sediment and erosion controls. And then there's also the controls that we have for our distinct pollutants. So I had the example of the portable toilet. I have fuels, I have waste, I have things like that. So those require other source controls for those distinct pollutants. But we really encourage people to explore the drainage controls as being low cost. It's just how you choose to manipulate the ground. I had one photo of many that I have of surface roughening. And what you're trying to do is promote infiltration. The less stormwater runoff you have and the more you can uh, more tools you can implement to try to stabilize the soils and surface roughening can help to stabilize those soils for erosion control, help to keep the dirt in place. That's your goal. You don't, you don't want erosion, so you want to keep the dirt in place. So putting in various different styles of surface roughening, that's very inexpensive. I'm not purchasing a product. It's just how I choose to manipulate the ground. Another example that I didn't show, which is another grading technique, is terracing. So we can put in benches on slopes. And it almost looked like if we had changed the, the contours of the slope a little bit with the surface roughening, that yes, we could have had some benching, we could have had some terracing going on there. And that's a great drainage tool because it helps to capture the stormwater on the benches themselves. And then the, the rest of the strategies is just like, well, how do you want the water to move around? I've tried to promote infiltration as much as possible to reduce the volume of stormwater runoff. I know I'm going to have stormwater runoff. How do I choose to keep the water away from areas where I'm working, away from storage areas, away from areas of disturbance? So I'm capturing, diverting, controlling how run on is moving onto my site if I can't stop all of it from coming on. And then comes in our conveyances. So we were using these examples of these, these ditches, and I can have open channels, and there's products you can buy as well, but I can cut in a ditch. I can build a rundown as a conveyance to capture stormwater. So now I'm just concerned about erosion in my channel or in my ditch, and then there's tools for that as well. Then our entrapment facilities. So I was showing these examples of sediment traps. And of course, I can graduate out to a larger basin. These are all typically temporary. The ones I was showing you were all temporary. The equipment's already out there. It may be in the way, and of course, that can be difficult to move, but if I site them correctly, then it's stormwater quantity management. So I'm shoving all that water into that basin. Yeah, at some point, I guess it's going to discharge, and I'm going to be thinking about the, the quality of the discharge. But whether that's the inexpensive route you were trying to steer me towards, uh, you know, you, you take a look at a lot of the purchased products and they're, generally speaking, either to help me with stabilizing and getting vegetation or their sediment control. 
that's what they are. So me planting and then some means of cover, if you will, to protect my seabed and provide erosion control while I'm waiting for the grass to grow. And then we see all these barriers. All you know, you get these different magazines, erosion control magazines, stormwater magazine, and they're they're all packed with ads and they have all these great new products out there for inlet protection and different kinds of waddles and, and things like that. And I, there's a, a use for all of those, but the focus is keeping the dirt on the dirt so you don't have a heavy reliance on barriers themselves. That's my pitch. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, with regard to inspections in, um, in the wintertime, what is the frequency of inspections? Do you lessen them? Do they stay? Uh, is this permit specific? But um, basically, what would be the reasonable inspection frequency during the winter, assuming the site was inactive? Well, a, a good example is, is here in, in Colorado, and we see this uh, fairly widespread, is what we call the winter exclusion. So I have, and here in Colorado, there's three components. I have snow, and I have snow everywhere. The entire site is covered with snow with no threat of melting. So that's the second component. In a shutdown, and under that scenario, we can postpone. We can back off our inspections to every 30 days, and there isn't a need for a post precip inspection because the precipitation is frozen, so I don't have any runoff. Now, I, you know, that, as soon as we start working out there on the side, or one of those components goes away, then we revert back to our other scenario. So at that point, I would just be looking at other factors. And so we had our wind question out there. Uh, and so, you know, if I, if I have my cell fence and I got high winds, I'm looking at or for drifting snow, I'm looking for at if my barriers are still up in place. And so that would be what I'm inspecting if, and I may, maybe I have wildlife. So maybe I'm not. Mm -hmm pathway of uh, migratory animals and they're, they're coming so I got elk coming through and you know that they could be damaging my site or you know others weekend warriors or you know whatever out there on my, on my site but my threat is going to be greatly diminished if I, I don't have any you know winter is my BMP if, if, I, if I don't have any snow melt out there so I can back off on my inspections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Lisa from uh, Toronto again. She was saying, you know, we she'd likely recommend before and after a significant snow melt, even even a rainfall, um, and also if migratory <laughs> animals come through. <laughs> uh, do you like that? I do like that. Um, and then, you know, is there really a need to inspect uh, if there isn't snow a snow melt event? But I think that's where the migratory animals come in. <laughs> um, sure. So uh, Leanne uh, was wondering, uh, what's your favorite type of winter inlet protection? Uh, I noticed on the street, I think that was probably out by the old airport. If I don't, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with that uh, that photo, but uh, it could be anywhere in in that area. The um, you were actually marking the um, the the check dams that are running down the the curb the curb. So they had some curb socks. Yeah. yeah, the the socks there, and they were actually marked with a um, a reflector mm -hmm. so the plows don't take them out. Uh, but thinking of, of that in general, what are your favorite types of inlet protection? I think people are looking for different solutions, uh, especially during the winter months. It really depends on the, the profile of the inlet itself. For inlets are in a sump condition, so I'm in a low point and I got flows coming from all directions, uh, both sides. Of, of my curb facing, I've got flows coming, and then I have sheet coming across the uh, the roadway. So I'm in a sump condition. All the water's coming down here to the this inlet. We can come up with uh, some purchase products that may be a little uh, less uh, higher profile and not sticking that far out in, into the roadway. Delineators can be very important. It just depends on, you know, the, the nature and the style that you put out there that they don't get, you know, you put cones out there, they get frozen, they get hit, they get shattered. 
or some other uh, the, the curb stocks had PVC pipe and they had just been painted orange. Part of the problem was PVC pipe goes under the uh, curb sock itself, so you do end up with a little bypass around there. But I'm a big fan of just the wire mesh rock wattles. During the winter, as we saw with the, the snow plow, that can be problematic. It creates a higher profile. Some of the purchase products may remain in place a little better and they may provide me with the same style of filtering because all I'm looking for is ponding and filtering at whatever point in time it melts. These, the, the ones that get clogged up with dirt and leaf litter, then, then I just end up with a bunch of water out there on the roadway. No question, I've seen that as, as well. So I don't know if there's any one perfect style of inlet protection, the rock wall, they can get clogged up with ice too, and then I get in that public safety hazard with too much water out there in the roadway. But if you are concerned about plows, or if you're out on public roads, or you're clearing roads yourself, you may want to avoid the rock wall. So you just have to find something that has the weight and the profile, but still going to be able to give you that filtration at whatever point in time it goes live. When I've got stuff moving down the curve flow line. That's on a sum condition. When I'm on grade, there's really only so many different types and styles that I can actually come up with. So I got my roadway like this, and I've got a box, I got an inlet right here on grade. And if I put some monstrous rock sock out there in front of it, those are just going to bypass the feature. If that's what I want to do, I guess that's fine. But all the water's going down there, and I got to be thinking about what's down there. So the example that we had with all the delineators, that whole series of curb checks, those rock socks going up and down the curb, those are the styles that we will traditionally see with on grade inlets out there. Mm -hmm. If I have a area inlet, so I'm in the middle of a, a parking lot, that sort of thing. I've got to be thinking about, do I have some reservoir space? So instead of me putting a rock waddle all the way around this area inlet in a, in a parking lot, if I'm concerned about turbid water getting into that box and rock waddles aren't, aren't going to cut it out there while well, well, i got traffic out there. And if I put some of these other like dandy bag products and it's two dimensional, it can get covered up, it can get frozen. Some, some of the other inlet uh, style of inlet protection where the grate comes up and now I have this reservoir below the grate itself might be better for those kind of applications. And it, it's going to vary just based on the, the nature of your, your storm events and the kind of traffic you have out there. But uh, inlet protection can be a tough one. And so this is where we really focus on um, robust upgrading controls. So I'm not relying that heavily on inlet protection. But I may not be able to get away from delineators if I'm on a public roadway. Yeah, right. <clears throat> um, uh, coming out of Toronto, they, they had another uh, question for you. In your experience, where are people going wrong? And it's written down there in the uh, control panel if you want to look at it. Uh, and as follow-up, um, is it that they underestimate the flows? Is it more out of sight, out of mind, particularly if they haven't, uh, if they're not on site as often if, uh, if the site is inactive? Or is it that uh, they have no idea that BMPs will be effective, effective during the winter? So where, where are people mostly going wrong? That's a tough question to make a, uh, a broad sweeping generalization uh, about. I, I think that as a, as a general statement, I still see a heavy reliance on uh, barriers and sediment control and we draw very distinct differences between erosion control and sediment control and there's still a significant group of people out there in the construction industry that don't get that concept and we, we keep trying to drive home the point that there are no BMPs that do both I, I you know, I'm not going to drop dirt out on a blanket. I, I can choose to do that, but that's not what it's for. So I can morph a BMP into something else. So we see people erecting barriers. This love affair with straw waddles, we still see a lot of sill fence out there, and really not much attention or focus to the drainage controls themselves. 
I was uh, taking a look at a couple of construction sites last week. We're getting ready to do a class that has a field trip component to it. So we were taking a look at a couple of different different sites, and it was not entirely flat. You know, there were some slopes, there were some grades, and I didn't really see a lot of a lot of drainage controls, a heavy reliance at the perimeter. And so that's where the focus is. And these guys may be thinking, well, I can't have these controls because they're going to be in the way. And it's like, well, now you're, you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot. If you can't incorporate some of these grading techniques, whether it's berms or other drainage controls into those activities and those operations, then, yes, you are relying completely, 100%, on your perimeter controls themselves. Me making a, other generalizations is... Uh, potentially there's still a significant amount of people that that don't get storm water and they would just assume somebody do it for them and that can create its own set of problems hey we do consulting ourselves we don't install BMPs but we do do consulting out there in the, in the field but we do safety training as well we try to make comparisons that uh, it's no, the environmental stuff is no different than than safety. You incorporate it into your business practices. And if we treat stormwater like it's this other thing that we do, and it just becomes an annoyance, then it's extraordinarily difficult to be successful. So if I was to make another generalization, it would be perhaps that people don't really take it that seriously or don't put enough time into it. And yeah, it, it is going to take some time. I recognize that you know superintendents, foreman, project managers, they're doing other things. Yes, I know, but you're also doing safety as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's great points, really good points. Um, anyone else have any anyone um, any questions for the group or for Tom? Um, we are uh, it's it's open. You're welcome to talk in the line um, and you know just. Uh, Pose any questions. Um, it, it's really this is kind of eye opening for me, uh, Tom. Just, just I really can't get over the fact that um, you've got to really prepare for it now. I wish I could kind of take all my contractors and maybe we're just going to send out an email and just say, hey, is it time for you to start preparing for the winter season? Because even our folks in the Pacific Northwest, this is their rainy season. They start getting some real heavy um, uh, rainfall. And even then, uh, is that season, seasonal change? So they too need to be prepared for, uh, you know, just for what kind of additional volumes they're going to have to deal with from from a stormwater perspective. Um, but it's it's great. Uh, so you know, thank you very much for uh, coming on and, and uh, giving your two cents on winter prep. Um, if no one has another question, I'm I'm going to wrap it up. We'll finish right at the top of the hour. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, let's see. Well, I want to. You could uh, spin back to the opening slide with my contact information. If anyone needs to drop me an email, we have our we have our website. I think I have it oh, one shoot. more time. Hold on, let me see if uh, yeah, I have it right after my uh, thanks to Hain Shio. Mm -hmm. It was the one with the pictures of both of us on there. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, before we wrap up, and while we have a couple people on the line still, uh, I want to thank Haynes Geo again for their generosity and their commitment to education. Um, as you're looking to prepare your construction site for the seasonal changes ahead, please consider visiting HaynesGeo.com to locate your local distributor. Uh, you can also find them in our products and services guide on StormwaterOne.com. But uh, thanks again to the folks at Haynes Geo. We really appreciate the support, and so don't the students. Um, as Tom was just mentioning, here's his contact information. Altitude Training Associates is uh, based in the Rockies. Uh, they cover uh, a good swath of land out there from Wyoming, uh, Montana, Colorado, um, all the way down to New Mexico. Right, Tom? Yes. Yeah, I was in uh, New Mexico last year. I've been to uh, Utah. I, I travel a little further out. I've been to Kansas and in Missouri, Scott probably does more traveling mm -hmm. than than I do. But you can check out our website, which is uh, just altitudeta.com, and we do have some open enrollment classes that we do 
in Montana and other locations around Colorado, but we have training hubs where we're, we're hosted at different locations. I'm also an adjunct faculty at Red Rocks Community College in Lakewood, Colorado, so I teach seven different water quality related courses there, so that's one of our one of our training hubs. But we do safety as well. I'm off to Cheyenne to do uh, two, two days at Laramie County Community College. We have a couple of days of safety training up there. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, thank you again, Tom, for joining us uh, today. And again, we will send out a you know full length unedited version of this uh, video momentarily, uh, so you can have it on. Um, and I'll have it on demand uh, for everyone who, who joined us. And then we'll cut up a smaller, a smaller truncated version uh, in a few weeks here. Uh, but uh, if no one else has anything else to uh, say or ask, uh, we will wrap it up here. And uh, again, thank you for your participation. And we'd love to hear your feedback. So thank you so much. Andrew, thanks for hosting. Absolutely. Thanks, Tom, for uh, helping us out with this really great stuff. We'd like to get your training up there on the website, too. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk some more about that a little later on. But, uh, you know, thank you again. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Cheers, my friend.